Welcome to today's Bible study for New Macedonia Baptist Church in Newport, Kentucky. I'm Pastor Randall Baker and today we will be on uh, Numbers chapter 22. As usual, we'll read a block of text and then we'll go back through and try to explain it. <clears throat> Pardon me. I would like to remind you that uh, if you have a gift or an offering or any kind of love gift or anything you'd like to send it in, send it in to P.O. Box 151. Alexandria, Kentucky, 41001. Thank you uh, for what you've given. Thank you for what you will give, and may God richly bless you for it. Before we begin, I would like to also just ask you to pray for some people. Uh, Geneva Harold is still going through some issues, broken arm and some other things. Broken shoulder, actually, or arm near her shoulder. And some other issues. Uh, just keep her in your prayer. C.A. Griffith. Going through all kinds of problems now, heart trouble, uh, diabetes, and now to add to all that, cancer as well. Starting, uh, uh, he started his chemo real soon uh, this week sometime, I believe, or at least have a, have a uh, meeting about it. Just keep him in your prayers. He needs prayers badly. Uh, Lucy Mays, uh, Nancy Combs, John and Faye Little, Truman Turner, his family. My sister Sylvia, brother William, uh, Ruth Eads, and all the old uh, and infirmed in any way, the widows, the widowers in the church, uh, and uh, all, all certainly all the sick of any kind. That you know, I mean, if I forget to mention anyone, I, I, I ask your forgiveness. But uh, God knows who you are, and uh, and you keep everyone in your prayers. And if we all keep everyone in prayers, we should cover everybody. We would like you like you to also pray for our church and. Uh, and uh, the congregation of it, and of course the lost. Always keep the lost in, in, the, in the front of everything of your mind. And uh, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the many, many wonderful things, many blessings that you bestow upon us, Lord. You're a good, a great, and a perfect God. You're able to do all things, Lord. All things that you've done are perfect. And although we do fail you a lot of times, Lord, we just ask you to forgive us. Bless us. Bless these prayer requests that I mentioned, Lord. Be with us in all things. Bless our uh, Bible study today on chapters uh, 22 of Numbers. And just bless our understanding of it and our reading of it, Lord. And, uh, and we thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for all you've done for us. The many times you have blessed us with the reading and the understanding of your word, Lord. I ask you to continue to do so if it be your will. We ask all this according to your great and your perfect will, Lord. And we'll give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. And amen. As I said, we're going to be reading through uh, chapter 22. Uh, we'll read a block of text and then, uh, and then uh, pretty much uh, try to explain that. And as this one goes, it is pretty much in blocks of six uh, as per subject. So right now we're going to read through uh, verses 1 through 6, and we're going to go back in and try to do some explaining of it. Number 1, verse 1 says, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho. And ba Balak, or Balak, rather, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because there were many. And Moab was distressed because of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are around us, about us, round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, Balak, the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people. They are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed and whom thou cursest is cursed. So 
chapters 22, 23, and 24 all, they tell, they tell this strange story here of, uh, of two men, of, uh, of one, uh, Balak, or Balak, Balak, the king of Moab, and uh, two was Balaam, the, the, a prophet. Now, some say he was a false prophet, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say he was a false prophet. I don't think that's exactly accurate, but I'm going to clarify that just in a minute. But uh, there is a question by many whether uh, Balaam or Balaam is a good guy or is he a bad guy. Now, if we only had these chapters, these three chapters in Numbers here that talk about him, you might get the impression that Balaam is a good guy, that he is a prophet of God. But we can read about him in a whole lot more in more places. In uh, we can learn from from Numbers chapter thirty one, Deuteronomy twenty three, Joshua thirteen and fourteen. We can read about him in, in Nehemiah and Micah and Second Peter and Jude and in Revelation. And that explains more to us. That tells us that Balaam was a greedy a greedy practicer of divination. And we even read about that in this one that he was a diviner, and uh, and that's one who who through false gods or, or false uh, uh, idols or something. They try to tell the future or they try to bless or curse people or they try to do stuff like that. Kind of like a sorcerer of types or something. Now, I said he is not a false prophet uh, because a false prophet is, is something whose, whose predictions don't come true. But I think he had, a, he had a reputation that his curses, his blessings, and his uh, predictions, I think they came true. I think he had a uh, good reputation for that or bad reputation, however you want to say it. But he had the reputation of those things happening and coming to truth. Now, uh, uh, though they weren't through the God of creation, I don't believe that at all. Uh, but by were false gods, false idols, and and uh, and those things are all we know essentially they are of Satan. So there is evidence other than the Bible that uh, Balaam existed now or Balaam existed. Now don't uh, get me wrong here; the Bible is plenty enough evidence, but there is some evidence other than the Bible. They found some writings uh, on a fragment of a, of a destroyed wall. That said, at least this, uh, it said a lot of things. I think it had about 50 words or so on, but it's, they, they, they were able to decipher this very clearly from it. It said, warnings from the book of Balaam, the son of Beor. And it goes on to describe him. It says he was a seer of the gods. So this man was who the Bible says he was, and he was the son of Beor, just as they said he was. So it's obviously the same person. Now, also in this story, I said it was a strange story, and it is, because it's a story of a talking uh, ass or a talking donkey. Now, Israel had just defeated Og and Sihon, uh, Og the giant of Bashan, and, uh, and they were occupying that land there, and they were set up near the Jordan River, east of Jericho, and they were set to go over the Jordan River to, to conquer the first city of their inheritance. They were north of Moab, where Moab could look down over them. But when, uh, uh, or yeah, Moab could look down over them when they were in a plain. When, when uh, Balak uh, and the Moabites saw the Israelites and heard how they had destroyed Og and they had destroyed Sihon, how they were afraid. So they teamed up with the Midianites uh, to hire Balaam to come and to curse Israel. And that was designed to weaken them so that they could possibly defeat them or drive them away. Now, uh, Balak could see uh, the Israel, that Israel. He could see where they were, from where he was, and he could see that they were too many of them. He could see that they were too powerful uh, for Moab to fight on their own, for them to fight and to defeat on their own. Now, verses 7 through 12 says this, And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam, or Balaam, however you want to say it. And God uh, came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. 
So the messengers, and the messengers were elders, they were probably uh, pretty high-ranking people of Moab and of Midian, both countries, and they took some gifts, or they took some rewards to gift Balaam for his divination. And I remember I told you before that he was a diviner, he, was, he, he did divination. It's kind of sorcery, it's certainly evil. And for his divination services, and they told, uh, they told him about Israel. And how uh, uh, what King Balak had said to tell them, they told them all that King Balak had said or Balak had said to tell them about them. Now, my guess is that like everyone else, Balaam had heard about the God of Israel and the great things he had done for Israel in Egypt and how that he had parted the Red Sea for them and all the miracles that he did. And uh, so he consulted their God. That's why he was talking to the Lord. He was talking to the God of Israel. Because we can read in Numbers uh, 22 and 23 and other places that Balaam and Balak, they offered their sacrifices in the high places of Balaam. We read that in this chapter, which was a false idol. So uh, Balaam was a worshiper, uh, worshiper of idols. God doesn't have uh, diviners. He does have prophets. Uh, but we know that all their uh, information comes through God, uh, through visions and stuff through God. But the God of Israel did indeed speak to Balaam. And at first he told him that he could not go. He could not go with uh, Balak's people, with the, Mo with the Moabites and the, and the elders uh, of Moab and Midian. He told him he could not go. And then verse 13 through 19 says this, And Balaam rose up. Well, let's see. Yeah, it says, and uh, 13 says, And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the, la for the Lord refuseth to let me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they, and they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus say Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto uh, the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. So here uh, Balaam, or Balaam, Balaam, he, he sends the messengers away, but Balak Sends more, sends them right back, more and more than were before, and more important people, more, more, more princes and stuff. There are elders that are higher up to Balaam, and they have with a promise of even more money, with even more power. And uh, Balak tells him uh, not to let anything, anything, keep him from coming to him. Now Balaam calls uh, God the Lord, my God. We see that in one of the things he called in one of the verses there. He calls him the Lord, my God. <laughs> Now, that doesn't mean that he's a worshiper of the God of Israel, the God of, of creation, but that he has to obey uh, his voice. He has no other choice. God is, is in control. God is his Lord. He can't do anything about it. God is his Lord or master or control at this point. He, can't, he has no will of his own. He can't change it. But uh, at this moment, and, uh, and so Balaam is very, but he's very eager to go. He wants to go. He really wants to go, and he's very interested in the riches and the, and the power that's promised him. But, but he is afraid of the God of Israel. He is afraid of him. I'm sure, as I said before, I'm sure if he's heard of all the things that God has done to Israel's enemies and all the wonderful things that God has done for them, so I'm sure he's afraid. But he goes to ask God once again if he can go. Now, 20 through 21, these two the verses, it says, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto you, that shall thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Now, we need to pay real close attention to the wording here. Now, God said... If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. 
in verse 21, it doesn't say that they came from ba for Balaam. They didn't say that. It just says that he rose up early and saddled his ass. And I think he was ready. I think this is where Balaam's uh, big sin lay. I think this is what he sinned against God right here because he wasn't waiting for uh, the sign that God told him. It was the men to come to talk to him or to come to ask him to go again. He was just presumptu presumptuously uh, got up and prepared to go, showing that he was greedy and that he wanted their reward and that nothing was going to keep him from, from trying to go and get it. Verse 22 through 27 says this, And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he, now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned away out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself under the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. So verse 22, uh, it, it, it tells me that Balaam did not follow God's instruction to wait for the men, but decided on his own that he was going to go with them. Because the Bible says then that God's anger was kindled. Now, why would God have been mad if Balaam was just doing what he had told him to do? So obviously, he didn't wait for the men to come. He just he got, got saddled his ass and was ready to go, and he was riding along with them uh, because that's what he wanted to do. As we saw there, Balaam, Balaam was riding, or Balaam was riding an ass. He was riding a mule or a donkey. And two servants were with him. And we know, of course, that the princes of Moab uh, were with him. Now, a lot of things went on in there. Now, we don't hear anything else about the servants. We don't hear anything else about the princes. We don't know if they saw... Uh, all the commotion that was going on with Balaam. We don't know if they, uh, if they saw the, uh, the, the uh, angel in the way. We don't ever see that, but we do know this. We know they probably didn't hear the ass or see the angels, but uh, the first time he sees them, he veers off and, and Balaam uh, hits the ass, and then the next time uh, he sees it, it's in a narrower place, and he tries to slide, he tries to get over and, 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 and get across and tries to uh, squeeze by that angel, and he crushes or smashes Balaam's foot uh, between her and the wall. Now, the next time, the last time, there was no room to pass by at all by the angel, so the ass just dropped down on the ground uh, right underneath of uh, right underneath of Balaam. Now, there's no mention of the angel having a sword yet, but we know that he does. Uh, so far, at least, so far, uh, as far as Balaam is concerned, it seems pretty normal. It's just, uh, it's just an ass misbehaving. So Balaam hits the ass for the three times, for three times, and the last time he does, he hits her with a staff, with his, uh, with his uh, shepherd's crook or staff. Verse 28 through, uh, through 35 to uh, finish up this chapter says, And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee? that thou hast smitten me these three times. And Balaam said unto the ass, because thou hast mocked me, I would there I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast written ever since I was thine own until this day or thine until this day? Was I ever want want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I have slain thee and saved her alive. And Balaam uh, said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, 
for I knew not that thou stood, stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. There are actually a few more verses. We're not quite finished with it. We will be finished in a moment here, though. But uh, 28 through 35, now I was talking about now, now these things are different. Now all of a sudden things change around. God gives the donkey the power to speak. He gives the ass the power to speak. Now, uh, some people say, well, that's not a, such a big big deal. You know, a lot of birds can speak. They can say a lot of words. Some of them can say up to 150 words. The difference here is this, though, uh, is that the ass has discernment. It, it understands what it's saying. It knows what it's saying. It has, it's having a coherent conversation with Balaam. And the ass asks Balaam a question. He says, what have I done? What have I done? Why, why have I done deserve, deserve this? And why are you doing this? And, and you know what's just as amazing as amazing about that uh, uh, ass speaking is that Balaam doesn't even seem uh, surprised that the animal has talked to him, and he just talks back to it just the same as you as you would anybody else. But I think that that Balaam he deals with the supernatural things all the time. Uh, he gets information from Baal, which is the which is actually the devil, these false prophets are, and now he's on a mission from God, and God has spoken to him. When he had conversations with God, God talking to him, he talking to God, and the ass tells Balaam that she, uh, that she had asked ask him, said, has she ever acted that way, uh, such a way before, and he said, nay, he said, no, you have never acted that way, but uh, he still was pretty mad at her, but and then we see that God opens uh, Balaam's eyes to see that the angel with a drawn sword is, uh, is standing in the ass's way. And Balaam at this time, he's more so now he falls on the ground probably because uh, when we see angels appear to people, you know, they're bright and shiny and, and their countenance is, is just so uh, glowing and their, and their raiment is white and, and there's just a, just a, a glow and an and a, uh, aurora about them. And... Uh, People fall down and worship these things all the time because they're just, you know, they just, they don't look like anything else you see here on earth. So I think that's why Balaam fell down. And then, and Balaam admitted that he had sinned by coming and that he would go back home. He'd turn around and go back home. But the angel told him to continue. He said, but not to stray at all, at any at all, from what God said or to say or to do. To do exactly as God had told him, exactly what God had said to do. Do that and say exactly what God has said to say. Uh, verse 36 through 41 to actually finish it up and says this, And when uh, Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto a city of Moab, which is in the border of Arnon, which is in the utmost coast. And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore, did it, wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor and Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came uh, unto Kirjath Hujath. And Balak offered oxen and sheep, and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal, that hence he might see the utmost part of the people. So Balak, he greets Balaam, but he rebukes him right away for not coming when he called him the first time. Time that he can, he said, I can have made you rich and famous and powerful. But Balaam tells him that he is bound. He's bound and he has to do exactly what God tells him to do, no matter what Balak tells him. He or offers him, he still has to do exactly what God tells him to do and to say. Uh, uh, Black then offers oxen and sheep to his false god uh, up there in the high places. And, uh, and then he sent for Balaam, and they went up to the high places, and that's a place where they go. It's usually a grove of trees or something like that where they've got uh, idols and stuff set up, and that's where they go and they worship these false items idols. But now it was high up. It was probably on the top of a high hill or, or a small mountain or something. And they could look out and they could see Israel scattered out all over those plains down there. Uh, 
So we're going to get more into this, chapter 23 and 24, chapter, both these chapters, uh, get more into it and what happened and how God turns those uh, curses that uh, Balak wanted Balaam to do, how God turns them all into blessings, and we'll get more into that as we go along. But thank you for joining me here today. Read and study these next couple of chapters so that you will know... Uh, uh, what what uh, is in them and you can get a good idea about it now we have gone over some things and maybe you've got a better idea of what was going on in this story now go back and read uh, chapter 22 again with some of the ideas that uh, I presented here and uh, and see if you can get a better understanding maybe you can understand more of what uh, even what I have talked about or what I can understand of it maybe God will bless you with understanding of it and then maybe you can let, tell other people about it and tell them uh, the great things that God has done God can do wonderful things. He can do great things for us. He did great things for Israel. He can still great, do great things for us. He's still a God that is able to do all things. He's a great, a perfect God that's able to do all things. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this 22nd chapter of Numbers. We thank you for all the book of Numbers. We thank you for all the Bible. Lord, it's a good and a great and a perfect book that's uh, incorruptible, that has no errors in it whatsoever, Lord, but it's perfect the day it was written until the day uh, that you take us all from this world, Lord, and we thank you for it. We thank you for this inerrant word, Lord. Ask you to bless uh, bless us with it, Lord, and, and give us that desire to, to learn and study it as you would have us to do, Lord. And we'll thank you for it. We ask you to bless each prayer request that was made before the the Bible study, Lord, and bless each one in your perfect good way. And uh, and just uh, heal those that are sick, Lord, those that are broken hearted, Lord, whatever, whatever it is, physical, spiritual, or mental need we all have, Lord, bless us in that whatever way you can. And we'll thank you for it, and we'll give you all the glory, praise, and honor in all things. In Jesus' name we do pray, and amen.